Brother Coy, could you please ask the blessing on the offering this morning? Holy Heavenly Father, we count it a joy and a privilege to come before you this morning. Lord, we come to worship you and praise and honor you because you deserve all the worship and praise and honor that we could ever give. Father, we thank you for this time that we can uh, hear your word preached. Uh, thank you for your word, Lord, that gives us instruction and guidance. Lord, thank you for uh, the tithes and offerings, Lord, that will be taken and used for your honor and glory. Lord, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you. May be seated.
You may remain seated and turn over to page number 44. Page number 44. Let's all stand together and turn over to 178, page number 178. And after the first verse, the choir will come down and we'll go around and greet each other, welcome each other to the house of God this morning. <laughs>
start making their way back to their seats and on that last verse. my song in eternity be oh what a wonder that jesus loves me i am so glad that jesus loves me jesus loves me jesus loves me i am so glad that jesus loves me jesus loves even me Amen. thank you may be seated and turn over to page number 448 page 448 Kaylin's got a special for us this morning. to confess <clears throat> the words are now in that transition spot between a bifocal and a far focal we'll see how this goes <clears throat> Pharaoh's 
decree was just part of the plan Then were other saw a murderer And a lowly Jew God found a faithful servant Who could lead his people through And the way things are will not be for forever children are today may just be the start of the blessing they'll become but for now it's only seen through God's eyes and a mother's heart God knew before the world was formed there would need to be a perfect sinless sacrifice to set his people free and when jesus came they mocked his name but in mary's heart she knew he would be the savior and god's promise would hold true and the way things are will not be for forever and who your children are today may just be the start of the blessing that will become but for now it's only seen through god's eyes and a mother's heart oh a mother's heart can thank her lord for his blessings every day for his faithfulness in answer prayer before she sees his way and a mother's child is her heart she hopes one day they'll know no matter what the circumstance her love will only grow and the way things are will not be for forever who they seem to be today may just be the start of the blessing they'll become but for now it's only seen through god's eyes and a mother's heart oh the blessing they will be but for now it's only seen through god's eyes and a mother's heart All right, if you would, let's take your Bibles this morning. Go to the book of 2 Timothy. Go to the book of 2 Timothy. I came real close to saying we were going to talk about Jochebed. Just to watch Brother Ethan's face. But, but I thought there may have been this loud exclamation, what are you doing? You know something, so I was like, no, I don't want to, don't want to throw him in there. He's going to be preaching this evening. He's already told me, unless he changed his mind, that he's going to be looking at Jochebed. <laughs> So let's all stand together whenever you find your place, and we'll be in 2 Timothy chapter number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. <clears throat> Verse number 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord, I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience and without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. I want to bring our message this morning of the importance of a mother's faith. 
the importance of a mother's faith. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you once again for allowing us the great privilege of being able to be here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the godly mothers that are in this room today, and, and Lord, for the many testimonies that we have of how our mothers helped to mold us and shape us into who it is that you would have for us to be. We thank you, Lord, for a day that we can reflect on how important that it is and what you've set aside for it, and, and Lord, that, um, that we can honor them and in so doing honor you. Lord, I pray, God, that you would truly give us wisdom and help us, Lord, to align ourselves with your word and, and um, just to rejoice in what it is that you've left for us. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us salvation as a gift to be received. And Lord, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know Christ as Savior, that today would be that day of salvation. I pray, Lord, that you would have your perfect will and way throughout the services today. It's in Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. The epistles that, that Paul wrote to Timothy are, are truly a treasure because they describe uh, there's a mentoring, uh, there's a discipleship. It's a lot of instruction that has to do with spiritual leadership, uh, things to take place in the home, in, in place in church and individually. And as Paul is writing this second letter to Timothy, he begins to describe of him some things that really set apart his whole relationship. And I like the way that he starts it out because he, he's drawing this attention. He's looking at Timothy and he says, man, there's something uh, that's special about you. And you start studying out a little bit about those things. Uh, it's believed that that Paul led Timothy to Christ. That's why he refers to him as his, his dearly beloved son. He wasn't his son in the flesh, but he was his son spiritually. And, and uh, it's believed that Timothy came to know Christ during one of Paul's missionary journeys. And, and uh, so he's, he's speaking to that regard. And, you know, you think about that, that would be awesome, amen, uh, to be able to have the Apostle Paul led, uh, lead you to Christ. But, uh, but, you know, there were a lot of people that could testify that same thing. Uh, quite honestly, whenever Paul would write a letter to one of the uh, one of the churches, the church at Philippi, the church at Ephesus, the church at Colossae, whatever the case, there's going to be a lot of those people that would gather around and they would uh, they would be anxiously desiring to hear the things that Paul said because Paul was instrumental in them coming to know Christ as Savior. He could it could be said that he had a spiritual fatherhood, if you want to call it that, uh, to a lot of those uh, to those people. It also says, verse number three, that, uh, that Paul prayed for Timothy night and day. That was also something that was true of a lot of people. There was a lot of folks. Uh, Romans 1, 9, it says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. He talked about that to the Ephesians. He said, cease not, he said, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. In 1 Thessalonians, he was talking to the church at Thessalonica. He said, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Philemon, he says, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. There was a lot of people he was praying for. Yeah. That's not what it was that, that really, I mean, that was, it was true of Timothy as well, but that wasn't the, a, a big defining point. But in verse number four, Paul says that he was greatly desiring to see Timothy. And here's the defining moment. Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. It was the faith of Timothy that stood out above everything else. Paul knew, uh, Paul knew what, it li what it was like to live by faith. Amen. If there was anybody that could say, okay, this, this is what it's going to take, guys, to talk about this faith-filled life, Paul understood very much about what it meant to be able to, to live by faith. So for him to call out Timothy and say, Timothy, it's your faith, that unfeigned faith, that's what it is that stands out to me. That's pretty noteworthy. Paul was, Paul was good to bring about an understanding uh, in his letters that, that faith didn't stand alone. It wasn't just, a people didn't just say, well, you know, they got faith, and then he moves on. Whenever there was faith, there were other things that were attached to that faith that was very uh, needful in ministry. He mentioned that that faith was accompanied by love. Colossians 1.4 says, we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have to all the saints. He talked about uh, faith and, and, and how stability in your Christian life was linked to your faith. Colossians 2, 5, he says, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. In the letter to the Philippians, he said that if he wanted to see real faith working, he would just look at the Philippians. He said, I, I don't just want to see it. He said, whenever somebody starts talking to me about your church, I want to hear about your faith as well. 
Philippians 1.27, he says, let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, and that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That's how the gospel is spread, amen? The gospel is spread through a unified body. Ephesians 4.13 says the unifying characteristics that brought about the fullness of Christ in God's people was their faith. All that said, think about how much of a big deal it was that Paul was confessing. Everything that Paul wanted to see in Christians, whenever he looked and he says, you know, whenever you weigh it all out and you see all the things and how it's tied together, all the people that he's been uh, exposed to, the people that he's led to Christ, the people that he's been praying for, he says, the one thing that I want to see tied together in all Christians is their faith, and he says it's wrapped up in Timothy. He says that's how important that relationship is. All of the character of Timothy was his faith. He said not just faith, but he says the unfeigned faith. What does that mean, unfeigned? It means sincere. It means without hypocrisy, no put on. Timothy's faith was real in his life. Paul had seen a lot. He was, he was convinced that Timothy was the real deal. Turn back about five pages to Philippians chapter 2 real quick. Philippians chapter number 2, <clears throat> Paul was writing to the church at Philippi, and he's, he's telling them about Timothy. Now get a, get a load of what he says here in uh, Philippians 2, and go down to verse number 19. He says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. He says, man, I, I'm looking forward to sending Timothy to you. Verse 20 says, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with a father he hath served with me in the gospel. He says, man, I can't wait for you to see Timothy. He says, there's no man that I know of that is so set on his faith that his interest is just honoring the Lord Jesus Christ rather than seeking his own promotion. He said, this is the guy that is coming to you. And then Paul attributes that faith upward. He says, okay, uh, where did that faith come from? Back in our text. He says in verse number 5, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. He's looking at the faith of Timothy, and he says, I know where that came from. Yeah. That was your mama and your grandmama. Uh -huh. Amen. That's where those things came from. You know, the world puts a premium on a lot of different things. Uh, as far as the world standards and society, what, what sets apart there, there's a lot of things that people are supposed to pursue. There's a, a premium that is set on your net worth what you've got physically in the bank, or at least maybe your perception of what you have. Yeah. The world puts a premium on our looks. So much so that, oh, there's all the filters. Everybody's posting on the Facebook and on the Instagram. It's not even their real face. It's your false Facebook. Amen? It's, everything's got the filters. Everything's all smooth and clean. Wow, look at all these pretty people. I never see them at Walmart. What happened to them? It's called a filter. <laughs> That puts a premium on looks. The world puts a premium on your occupation. What's your title? You got to dress it up, amen? That's where the premium is. The world puts a premium on what you drive, where you live, what's your neighborhood. You know what God puts a premium on? Motherhood. God says that's something in short supply. Biblical motherhood is something to be valued. It's not, it's not everywhere that you look that everybody says, there's a biblical mother, there's a biblical mother. He says, no, no, it's in short supply. And as such, you recognize that whole supply and demand. Uh, there is a value that is established whenever you see something in such short supply. Whenever you see God saying, uh, there is a premium that I place on the home, and there is a premium that I place on how that home is ordered, it comes back to the mother, to the grandmother, to that maternal instincts in the home. Biblical motherhood is not always recognized, and it's not always appreciated in the way that it should be. But God has a lot to share with us about His desire and what it means for mothers in the way that they function in the home, the importance that they have in the home, and you start seeing it just in the practical application of how it plays out in Timothy's life.
First of all, there's, there's no expiration on faith. Amen. There's no expiration on faith. Uh, sometimes we've got a misunderstanding about that. We'll, uh, we'll see that in church. Somebody say, well, my days of service are over. I'm just going to coast on through. <laughs> Tell me that one in the Bible. God never says there's an expiration on your service time. Amen? There's always something to do. Uh, it may be that you're not walking the neighborhoods as much, but you're still praying. Amen? You, you, man, that's one of the most, uh, the, one of the key ministries in the church. And don't, don't ever think light about that. God will give you something to do. The same thing is true in motherhood. There's never a point where a mother loses that, that influence. A biblical mother, she's always got the influence. She's always uh, there to be able to promote that faith and to be able to push it forward for Christ. It says in verse number 5, it says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that's in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. He said, both of them. And I'm persuaded in thee also. He said, he, he, he didn't say, well, you know, grandma used to have a lot of faith and now mom's got a lot of faith. You know, uh, he, he doesn't drop them. Amen. Grandma's still around. Grandma's still uh, got that faith. It's still making an impact. So Paul makes the assessment that the faith of both Lois and Eunice were beneficial in the life of Timothy. Whenever you think about faith, faith is always developing. Amen. It's always developing. You never get to the end of it. There's going to be elements of your faith that you learn in your 20s. Everybody's in their 20s. Amen. There's things that you learn about that during that time. Guess what? It doesn't end there. It's going to continue on. Whenever you get to your 30s and your 50s and your 70s and your 90s, uh, whatever it is, there's always something that you're learning and gaining from the Lord. Amen. That would be the things that Lois brought to the table that Eunice didn't even have an idea about yet. Amen. There were things that Lois as a grandmother had been able to go through and experience in her life that was to, still helping to define the faith of Timothy that Eunice hadn't fell into yet. Yeah. She didn't know what's going to happen, but she knew that, uh, that, that God was going to be able to use her in that way. But, but man, Lois, she had already experienced it. That's why there's so many grandmothers who are spiritual giants in their family. That's not being derogatory toward the mother. Amen. It just means that grandma's gone through some extra stuff. Grandma has, has learned to depend upon God in this, in this way, in this way, and, and there's things that were going on, but, but all the while uh, she was learning what the Word of God has to say about it, and she was magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ through it all, and people were learning more about the Lord as they saw her faith and how it was instrumental in her life. When you get married, there's going to be new tests of faith. Amen. There's going to be things that you're going to uh, come into contact with you. You move out on your own. You're providing for a family. Now all of a sudden it's not somebody else that's providing breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You got to do it. Amen? Sometimes that's a lot of faith. That faith starts growing whenever you figure out that ramen noodles aren't what they're cracked up to be. <laughs> uh, man, I, I wish I had a pork chop. <laughs> 450. <laughs> There's faith that's growing. You have children, all these new things introduced in the home. It's growing your faith. You learn faith by, by depending upon God to provide just like He says that He will. Amen. All through your life, that's it. Boy, you're going through and you're like, I don't know how in the world this is going to work. This does not make sense, but God, you are God. I'm going to turn it over to you. And sure enough, God makes a way. And He provides, and you're like, look at that. I put the Word of God to the test, and God proved Himself faithful. Amen. Your faith develops whenever you gain things. Something falls into your lap you didn't anticipate. Boy, all of a sudden it's like, man, I can trust God. Your faith grows when you lose things. Your faith grows when you lose people. Because you learn how God is the one that you can cling to in the gain and in the loss. This is our, our first Mother's Day without my grandmother. And I miss her, but I know where she is. Yeah. And the Lord is always faithful. Yeah. I'm so thankful I can depend on Him in the things that are gained and the things that are lost. Timothy was learning all that from Lois and Eunice. You know, every mother, every grandmother, you have a ministry to your children. A mother and a grandmother. Uh, where's that ministry started? It goes to the Lord first of all. Amen? It's first to the Lord. But then that ministry, after that ministry to the Lord is realized, then all of a sudden there's an understanding that, you know, my, my kids and my grandkids have been entrusted to me. Yeah. There's a stewardship there 
for them, for their care. There's their, their physical needs need to be met, and the spiritual needs are to be met. Over in 1 Timothy chapter 4, just turn back one page here, you'll be in, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 5. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter number 5. And notice what it says here in verse number 14. Now again, uh, God's looking at, at all ages of life, all stages of life. There's something else to gain. And it says in 1 Timothy 5 and verse number 14, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. He's got instructions for a young mother. He says, you're supposed to guide the house. The husband is the head of the house. Amen. The husband is to lead the home. He's to be, to be the spiritual leader in the home. The mother is to guide the home. What does that mean? Uh, to guide, it's the same word. It's the same understanding. It's just like a shepherd shepherds the sheep. By the way, that's the same thing a pastor does. Amen. That word pastor, that's what it refers to. It's talking about the, the, there's a tender care of a shepherd for his sheep. Amen. That's the same thing that's used here whenever it's talking about a mother and the way that she guides the home. There is a tender care, a developing that's there. A mother is to guide young girls and to be able to order the homes themselves. Amen. She's to guide the boys to be men, not girl them up. Amen. Now notice the importance of that guidance. It says in verse number 14, he says, Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. You know, it's possible for Satan to get an advantage on a home because a mother chooses to not guide in relation to the Bible. Yeah. He's given this, he said, this is a ministry, this is very important. You know, uh, and this is one of those things where a mother, maybe in her 20s, she's going to look at that and she's like, you know, I, I don't know much of the Bible. I don't know those things. Well, you know more than you kid. Amen. Amen. Show them what you learn. Show them what you learn while you're still gaining more understanding of the Word of God yourself. Amen. God's going to use it at the right time. Those kids need to know that what you do and what you say lines up with the Word of God. They need to understand that the Word of God is the authority, and that's where it is that you pattern your life after. There's going to be times <clears throat> that you're going to need some help. Amen? Uh, sometimes people ask for it, sometimes they don't, but everybody needs it. There's every, every single time there's somebody that says, I don't have a clue what to do. What are you going to do? Maybe go to one of those older ladies. Those that have gone through things before. Uh, you go to a godly woman who has uh, learned what it means to be able to follow the Word of God. Now be careful, that's a very good yeah. qualifier there. There's a lot of people who are up in age that will share with you things that they have done or things that they have learned, but it's not from the Word of God. That's not where you get your counsel. Get it from those who have proved out the Word of God and know what the Word of God has to say. Amen. Turn over to your right just a couple of pages to Titus. Right past 2 Timothy is Titus. And notice Titus chapter 2, we've got some instruction to the aged women to teach the younger. So Titus chapter 2, look at what he says in verse number 3. <clears throat> it's amazing, all of this instruction given here, 1, 2 Timothy, Titus to mothers. The aged women likewise, this is verse number three, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, and the word of God be not blasphemed. What does it mean? Use the influence that you've, that you've gained. Now what is an aged woman? What is that? I ain't saying. <laughs> that really depends on your audience. Amen? If you're 35, there's some 20-year-olds that need your advice. Amen. There, there's somebody that needs to know what, what, they, uh, what did you do at that age? How did the Word of God meet the need? If you're 50, there's some 35-year-olds that are going through a season where they need to know what the Word of God has to say. Amen. If you're 18, there's some 12-year-olds that are looking for the pattern of your life. Right. Recognize there's always somebody that's, that's looking up to you and you need to be able to share that wisdom with them. Whatever your, whatever your age, you've got a ministry to the younger generation. You're setting a pattern on how others are going to live and uh, for those that are coming up behind you. If you can handle a situation and look at it and say, you know, that's what I want everybody under me to be able to do, man, that's great. 
If you can look at the way that you handle a situation and say, you know, if everybody did the same thing that I was doing, it would probably lead to the destruction of homes and churches. You're going about things the wrong way. Amen. Amen. God's got a pattern for the way that we're supposed to handle our life, and it's according to the Word of God. Uh, by the way, for the aged ladies, your ministry, your ministry is not to try to fit in with the younger generation. That's not what God says we're supposed to be doing. Uh, they don't need to think, well, i got a cool grandma. <laughs> Wonderful. That's not what God needs. Amen. That's not what the ministry that God gives you. Titus says that there's a pattern of holiness that's supposed to be taught. That's what it is that is supposed to be shared with that coming generation. Uh, it, it says you're going to have to love, you're going to have to share with the younger ladies how it is that they can love their husbands. How can they love their children? Isn't that something? What does that mean? That means there's going to be some times where your husband is not lovable. Amen. And neither are your kids. That's right. He says, it's those older, those uh, older generations going to be able to take the younger generation and say, let me tell you how you can still love them through all of this. They are going to be dumb. Amen. It's just going to happen, but here's how you love them. Yep. Amen. There's a pattern that's there. He says there's, a, there's also a potential of being, being and producing false accusers, drunkards, blasphemers of the Word of God if it's handled incorrectly. The guidance of the home, listen, it rests on mothers. That's so why I say if you can look to your home and say, you know, man, I had a godly mother growing up. Boy, that's a rarity. And that's a treasure. And you should have a premium on that. You should be on the phone already saying, thanks, Mom. I'm glad I had a godly mother growing up. Not perfect, but desiring to honor the Lord. Amen. And boy, God worked through that in our, in our family. My grandmother, my, my mother, I'm very thankful for those things. I'm thankful that that continues that I've got a godly wife who's a godly mother to my kids. Man, that's a treasure. I'm so very thankful for that. The guidance of the home rests on the mothers throughout the stages of life. Whenever you look at Timothy's family, it's pretty interesting because you can see faith displayed all the way through. You got Timothy, he's a young man. Hey Amen. His, his faith is there. It's established. It's, it, it, it draws Paul's eye, but boy, he's just getting started. Hey Amen. That's, that's faith in its early stages. You got the middle of life, that's Mama Eunice. Uh, she's, she's showing that faith. And then uh, you got uh, Lois in the latter stages of her life and yet still being called out for their faith. Paul says, that makes me rejoice. That makes me happy. That makes me say, I can't wait to be able to see you, to see all that faith in action. Secondly, there's a good reason for faith. There's a good reason for faith in your life. Amen? There's a good reason for Lois and Eunice to be able to display the type of faith that they had as well. What's the reason for their faith? What, what was so precious? Timothy. That's it. Moms, what is so precious in your home? that God has entrusted you to be a mother. It's your kids. That's the great treasure that's there. Of all the lessons of life that Timothy could learn, that lesson of faith is going to be the greatest. Faith comes by hearing. And that faith is shared through love. There's no greater qualities than those whenever you start looking at the, the expansion of that faith. Timothy can learn uh, all things in life. Man, he can learn how to fish. He can learn how to farm. He can learn how to, how to carpenter. But none of those things are going to serve him as well as what it means to be able to follow the Lord. That's going to set the place all the way through his life. You see, uh, there's always different things that can lead in our life. And all, uh, all, things, all things work together for good. Amen? To them the love of God, them who are the called according to his purpose. <clears throat> Whenever you start thinking about um, your leadership, how, how God leads or how we can lead ourselves, there's a couple of things that will happen. If God is leading, if God is leading in your, in your life, then every venture that He brings you to, everything that if He's leading, whatever it is that He brings you to do, it serves the purpose of bringing glory to Him and growing your faith, Amen. giving you a good testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Now, the other side, there's still ventures that you can do, but if man is leading instead of God, then all of those ventures can further your interest upon yourself and take you farther away from God. What's the, what's the thing? Who's leading? Who's leading? That's all that matters. 
If God's leading, by all means, follow Him. And whatever He brings you to, He's going to get the glory for it. Timothy knew that, that his mother and grandmother loved the Lord. He knew that they followed the Word of God. So by all accounts, all through his life, he's able to go through and say, Man, this is what it is that God has brought, brought me to. This is what it is that God is doing. Now, can you imagine? He gets a letter from Paul, opens that thing up, and he says, Man, I can't wait to see you. I'm on my way. I've heard about your faith. I, I've, I've heard about it in Lois and in Eunice and in yourself too. He says, I can't wait to be able to see you. There's a Christian reformer is. Lord Shaftesbury, he said, Give me a generation of Christian mothers and I will undertake to change the whole face of society in 12 months. Amen. That's pretty good. And it's a great thought to consider. But most, most mothers understand that her number one ministry is not the whole face of society. Her number one ministry are those faces that look at her at breakfast every morning. Those are the ones that need to see Mama following Christ. There's a continuance of faith. There's a reason for faith. Thirdly, there's, there's to be the observance of faith. The observance of it. Romans 10, 17 says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now that's not referring to just a casual thought of faith like it's background noise or something, uh, you know, something that's light. You don't, uh, you don't hear a message of faith on your phone and all of a sudden you're like, man, my, my name must be in Hebrews 11 too. Amen. It's not just that hearing that makes it so instrumental in your life. Whenever the Bible is speaking of, of hearing, it means giving heed to what it is that you hear. It's taking it all in. It's putting it into practice. In fact, Paul goes on in Romans chapter 10, uh, that same chapter where he says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And he makes the assessment. He says, he's talking to uh, the Israelites and he says, look, uh, he's talking about what we've seen in, in Isaiah. He says, uh, God is stretching out His hands all the day to you. He's, he's been calling you, but you've rebelled against Him. Amen? There's been the calling, there's been the things, but there has to be the reception as well. And we know that's, we know that's true. Uh, whenever you start thinking about faith, again, it's not just a matter of saying, well, you know, I am a person of faith. Wait a minute. It, is there a putting into practice that faith? Now we understand how that works for salvation. Amen? Uh, whenever a person is saved, it's not just because you heard the gospel. Right. Amen? Amen? Uh, the Bible tells us that, uh, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of that there's none righteous, no not one. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ came to this earth, God in the flesh, lived a perfect sinless life, went to the cross at Calvary, shed His life's blood to pay for the sins of man. Yep. On the third day He had been placed on the tomb. The third day He rose from the grave. He's now seated at the right hand of God the Father making intercession for us. He's listening for all those that will call out to Him. Now the gospel, uh, the, the message, the work of the gospel, it's complete. Jesus Christ has done everything yeah. for a person to be saved. That's right. But hearing about it doesn't make the change in a person's life. It's whenever you receive it for yourself. Right. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is a gift, but a gift has to be received before it's ever reckoned to your account. That's right. The same thing is true in every manner of faith. The same way that salvation has to be received, uh, whenever you start seeing something about faith, then that faith is, is supposed to be put into practice in your life as well. It's not just a matter of talking about it, but it's, but it's honoring God with it. The faith that a mother models that changes the lives of her kids, it's one that's proclaimed, but it's also uh, promoted, observed. It's taken into her own life. It's not just spoken about. He heard, the, he heard the Bible read. Think about how did Timothy observe faith in his home? Every time the scriptures were proclaimed, he was seeing that faith was real. Whenever that was, whenever that was the point of the line, man, they said, we, we got to be able to say, how do you know they did that? Look over in 2 Timothy chapter 3 real quick. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's look, verse, <clears throat> verse 10, Paul says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at, at Lystra, what, per, uh, what uh, persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. He said, you knew all of the stuff that I was going through, and yet you saw that the Lord delivered, 
Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He said, Timothy, it can happen to you as well. Evil men and seducers are actually worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But watch this in verse 14. He says, but, what's the next word? Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that, watch this, from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. He uses that little word, continue. Continue. You see, uh, he said, the word of God makes the difference in a person's life. He says, Timothy, you know those things. He didn't just wake up one morning, ah, know all the scriptures. Now, it was done on purpose. There was the reading of the Word of God. He was taught. There was an investment that was made in Timothy so that he would be able to grow in his faith, grow in his knowledge of the Word of God. Paul may have been his spiritual father that led him to Christ, but the emphasis on the Word of God that made his heart tender to receive Jesus Christ whenever that message was proclaimed, where did that come from? From the reading of the Scriptures from his mother, from his grandmother. Verse 14, he uses that word, he says, continue. His mother understood the things that, that needed to continue in his life. She didn't just assume that it was going to occur. She taught those things from the Word of God that were necessary. She showed him all of those things that were so needed. I guarantee you, she knew, she knew that there was going to be some other interests that were going to crop up in Timothy's life that could take him away from the will of God. She knew those things that were going to arise. But why? They happen to every single person. Amen? We all face a battle sometimes of saying, am I going to serve God or am I going to serve me? Whatever form it's going to happen, they, there's often decisions, usually it's daily. Amen? You have to determine about who it is that you live for. She knew that. And, and as such, then she was making sure that she was going to, to pour the Word of God into that boy. I'm thankful for the godly mothers that we have in this church that just pour the Word of God into their kids. Amen. So many things they want to crowd out the Word of God. Oh, they need to know that Jesus is much more important. I believe that Timothy heard his mother praying for him. I just believe so. I think that, I think that there were often times where he heard his name on her lips whenever she was praying. There was a, there was a mother, godly mother, her kids had grown and, and turned out well, and somebody said, what was the secret they said, What's the, what was the secret to them being able to turn out good? This was her response. She said, here's the secret. When in the morning I washed my children, I prayed that they might be washed in the fountain of a Savior's mercy. When I put on their garments, I prayed that they might be arrayed in the robe of the Savior's righteousness. When I gave them food, I prayed that they might be fed with manna from heaven. When I started them to, on the road to school, I prayed that their faith might be as a shining light brighter and brighter to the perfect day. When I put them to sleep, I prayed that they might be enfolded in the Savior's arms. What's the secret? Prayer. Amen. Why would you pray? Faith. Whenever you understand the power of the gospel and what the Lord Jesus Christ does for you on a day-to-day -day basis, you can't help but pray for your kids that they get to know that as well. Amen. Susanna Wesley I think she had 19 kids total, but there were 10 of them that lived. Most of them, or nine of them died in infancy or pretty, uh, pretty close after. But it was said, if you were to ever walk by Susanna Wesley's house and look in the window, it would be a pretty amazing sight. Said so there'd be 10 kids in there either running around doing their schoolwork, studying. And there would be a, a lady there in her chair with her apron up over her head. What in the world? She's trying to get away. She's hide and seek. No, no. That was her prayer time. Ten kids, she didn't have anywhere to go. There wasn't, she didn't have her special little room or anything. She was just there, but, but she would sit down and she would take her apron and put it back over her head. And she, the kids knew that whenever she had that apron over her head, she was praying, don't mess with mama. Amen. She knew that that was so very important for her kids. Of course, uh, John and Charles Wesley were her kids started the Methodist church. and Charles Wesley made a statement. He says, I learned more about God from my mother than from all the theologians in England. What is it? Practical faith. Honoring the Lord. You know, God can use a home where the faith is not just mentioned. It's not just talked about. 
but it's observed. It's put into practice. So how can a mother have a faith that's going to establish her home? How can she guide her home? Here's where it is. Live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's it. There's not, a, there's not a 10 step deal. Well, here's the top 10 things that you need to do for mother. No, no, no. Live for Jesus. Put Him first. Whenever He's first, it's going to be amazing how much you're going to desire the Word of God. It's going to be amazing just to be able to see how much that you need God's wisdom to be able to guide the kids in the way that they should. To be able to know that, that your kids need to trust Christ as Savior. How am I going to do that? How am I going to live for that? How am I going to promote the Lord? How am I going to teach Him those things? Better live it. If they see a duplicity in your home, if they see you saying one thing, doing something else, man, that's, that's not giving an honest testimony of the power of God, is it? When we live for the Lord Jesus Christ, we put Him first and honor Him. The Word of God has to be the first place. There's, there's got to be a place made for your prayer life. Should be the place where uh, the home should be the place where the things that, that our kids are, are taught us to continue in the Word of God. Man, that has to be first. Should be a place that makes the heart tender for God's directing. If you don't, if you have kids that aren't saved yet. Man, everything should be tendering their heart. That's what was taking place with Timothy. Yeah, that's right. Timothy it was being taught the Word of God. He was given instruction by Lois and Eunice. And then the day came whenever Paul came through. Paul gets the credit. Amen. He's like, oh, my dearly beloved son. Yeah, that's wonderful. Glad you led him to Christ. Amen. What about mama and grandma? Because mm -hmm. they've been tendering his heart all that time. That's right. Giving him the scriptures, telling him about a Savior who loves him. I tell you, moms, there's plenty of things that will try to crowd out Jesus out of your home. Yes. Don't let them. Don't let them. Be that guide for God. You may be here today, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior personally. You're not sure if you died today that you'd go to heaven. And I tell you, we're about to have a hymn of invitation. You can have that settled. Right. You can know Him, first of all. You can set the home on the right pattern right there. Maybe you would just want to come and say, you know, I, I just want to pray with my family. Just want to make sure that, that the Lord is high and lifted up and that He's honored in all things and that, uh, that His name is glorified. Man, this is a great time to be able to do that. Let's all stand together. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. Our Father, we do thank You for the grace that You give. We thank You for the wonderful love that You have. And, and Lord, we thank You for godly mothers. I thank You for the interest that You have in the home and how much of an impact that it's there. And Lord, uh, we can do a lot of things, but boy, the home is the, the place where Your name is, is exalted above all things. So I pray, Lord, that You would help strengthen our homes today. Lord, as we think about mothers and the, the critical part that they play, Lord, I pray, God, that, that every mother here is set to be able to honor you. I pray, Father, that you would use this time to be able to cement the faith that we should have. Help us, Lord, to honor you. If there's one here that doesn't know Christ as Savior, Lord, give them that strength just to be able to come and say, I need to, I need to have Jesus as my Savior. And, Lord, I pray, God, that you would get the glory of us individually, of our homes, and of our church. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Help us, Lord, to be mindful that there are so many things that, that attempt to vie for our attention. Help us to put you first in all things. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Page number 316. 316. While we sing, if you need to come pray, why don't you come out on that first verse. I have decided to follow Jesus.
as promised, Brother Ethan is entering in the back door. Dun, 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 dun. Amen. For all of our mothers, we got cupcakes for you. And they should be great. I haven't eaten one, so I'm just trusting that they are. If, if not, you just let me know later and say, that was the worst cupcake I ever had in my life. And I'll get you something else instead. If you just come, you're just looking for a whole bunch of stuff that the, the tap will run out. Amen. I'm just going to give you the heads up. But now make sure that you get one of the cupcakes and uh, appreciate you so much. Now, uh, dads, husbands, ain't your cupcake. <laughs> even if you're, even if mom says, no, no, you go ahead and eat that cupcake. I don't need it anyway. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. I'm telling you, that's a ploy. That is a ploy. She wants the cupcake. She's going to wait till everybody goes to bed. She's going to pull it down, just that little cupcake thing. She's going to take it down very easily. She's going to eat it. She's going to save the icing for last. Afterwards, she's going to say, I shouldn't have done that. But she'll be glad that she did. Amen. So make sure that you go by and get you a cupcake on the way out. Thank you so much for visiting with us today. If you're visiting with us, we're so glad that you're able to come out and be a part of our services today. Make sure that you're back this evening. And uh, we do have um, a choir practice tonight. Uh, Brother Ethan's going to be preaching tonight. Make sure that you're back for that. I'm looking forward uh, to that message as well. Amen. And uh, we'll close out here in a word of prayer. Brother Webster, would you dismiss us in prayer, please, sir?